How many of you have ever experienced something in your life that totally altered or changed your schedule? Anybody ever has had something like that happen? An event occurred in my life that threw me, it just came out of nowhere. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the nitty gritty details because it really doesn't matter. But it was a test, a hard test of my faith, my family's faith. It was, it was a test like I'd never been through. And so in the midst of all of that, um, there, there are many different ways that I prepare for messages. And any preacher, there's many different ways they might prepare for messages. Some um, will go to a particular verse that they might have read in their personal devotional study. And God will give them a message. Uh, others might read something in a devotional. Or they might uh, read a short story about an event and God gives them a message. Um, some preachers will hear another preacher preach a message and God gives them a totally different message than the message they heard preached because maybe the preacher said one line. And so there's many different ways. But then there's also a way you can prepare for a message is to personally experience something. And out of that comes the messages that come straight from a heart. So, as you consider our culture and all that we're dealing with in and around us, the subject I want to talk about today is keeping the faith or keeping our faith in a mind-boggling culture. Keeping the faith in a mind-boggling culture culture. I don't think that I would have to tell you very much about the fact that we live in a mind-boggling culture. If you watched the media yesterday, you found out about this awful event that happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, where two radical groups clashed. And in the midst of all of that, three people are dead, 20 some are injured. Not only, that, is that, not only is that going on, but we are on the brink, the possible brink of nuclear war Amen. here in our country. That's going on. We have a health care system that is completely messed up, and the politicians are doing nothing to fix it. We have got um, a drug epidemic that's going on around us, and that's nothing new. We talk about that quite often here. We've got people here in our congregation that are going through difficult things, awful things that they never saw coming. And maybe you're sitting here today thinking this is just too much. It's just, it just blows my mind. I can't even comprehend what I'm dealing with, what I'm going through, and what's going on around me. So how do we keep our faith in the midst of all of this? How do we keep our faith? Well, that's what I want to hopefully show you today of how whatever you're dealing with or whatever's going on in our culture, you can still keep the faith. And I just want to share with you four things. If you would turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 17 or look it up on your device, iPad, iPhone, Android, or it'll also be up here on the screen for you. Luke chapter 17, we're going to begin reading in the fifth verse. It's a very popular verse of scripture that many of us have studied and may, may even know by heart. The Bible says in verse number 5, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you, have as a must, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So how are we going to keep the faith in a mind-boggling culture? Well, the first thing we're going to have to do is use the faith that we have. Use the faith you have. If I were to ask you, do you believe the Bible? I would assume that nearly 100% of you in this room would say, I believe the Bible. Would you agree? You believe the Bible? Amen. We believe the Bible. Well, then if we believe it, then we have to use it. 
If I were to ask you, do you believe that God answers prayer? Again, I would assume nearly 100% of you would say God answers prayer. Amen? If we know that the, if we believe the word of God and we know that God answers prayer, then we must use those two tools by, in keeping our faith. Use the faith that you have. Do you believe that God can do all things and that nothing is too hard for him? Amen. If so, use it. Don't set it aside and forget it. Now, faith is undefinable, but I will tell you that faith is usable. In fact, Jesus talked about this type of faith over in Mark chapter 11 and verse number 22 and 23 and 24. He said, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says this mountain be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. If you are weak, and are in need this morning. Use your faith. Even if it's just the faith. The size of a mustard seed. Jesus said I can use that. Yes. I can use that. Even if it's that small. Does anybody have any idea how small a mustard seed is? Very, 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 very small. I tried to find one to put up here. But it was... The picture was too blurry, but anyway. But a mustard seed is extremely small. You see, I believe this is what Joshua did when Joshua was, was facing the leadership of Israel and all that was coming ahead and Jericho. We all are familiar with the story of that Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Can you imagine the faith he had to use, the faith he had to know when it came to fighting the battle at Jericho? That's the type of faith that we must have. Or what about the faith of Paul that kept him from not quitting? <laughs> I, Paul gets a lot of credit, you know, because Paul's a pretty good fellow. Uh, he wrote half or over half of the New Testament. And uh, we, we kind of put Paul on a pedestal and, and I mean, he was a great man of God. But you know, Paul had an issue. Paul had some problems. And he asked God to, to remove the, the problems away from him. And God told him, I'm not going to do that. But, I, I love the word but, do you? I love that word. But God's reply to him was, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Just a little bit of faith gets you a whole lot of grace. Amen. Just a little bit of faith. The faith the size of a mustard seed gets you a whole lot of grace. When the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for thee, Paul was able to pull himself up by his bootstraps, rely upon God, and to keep moving forward. Paul used the faith that he had. You might be asking, well, why do we need to use the faith that we already have? Well, you must remember that people are watching you. Parents, the best way for your children to have faith is for you to demonstrate your faith in front of them. Amen. That's the best way Amen. to teach your children to have faith is to demonstrate it for them. Friends... We as Christians have a wonderful opportunity each and every day to show our faith to the lost. Amen. Each and every day. So this issue I was talking to you about earlier that happened a couple of weeks ago. It was so interesting, I think, for him to watch this go on because, um, of course, my... All of my siblings, uh, as far as I know, um, have professed Christ. And, uh, 
And so we kept talking about praying and God's going to take care of this. And I could tell that attorney was like, what are y'all talking about? Yeah. And um, when the decision was made that we were hoping would be made, he said, uh, he looked at us and said, well, I guess your God came through. Amen. <laughs> you can have an influence on your lost friends by your faith. Yes. By your faith. <laughs> so number one, how are we going to keep the faith in a mind-boggling culture? We're going to have to use the faith that we have. Number two, we're going to have to pray, Lord, increase my faith. If you go back to Luke chapter 17 and verse number 5, look what the apostles say or even they kind of are asking a question here. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Can I tell you every day, every day can bring, uh, every day there's a possibility of sickness or there's a possibility of, a, of discouragement or there's a possibility of death. There's a possibility of accidents. There's a possibility of financial disruption. There's always going to be some type of distress. And can I tell you, if you're going to keep the faith and all that's going on around you, you are going to have to earnestly pray for the Lord to increase your faith. Right. So how do we do that? Other than praying for it, how do we do it? Well, we do it by studying. Romans 10 and verse number 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, let's just suppose for a moment that this afternoon you arrive home and you were informed of the death of a dear loved one. Let's just su suppose that occurred. God forbid. Who would you turn to or what would you turn to for comfort? I hope it would be the word of God. Because here's the reality. If we know that things are going to occur all around us. <laughs> you know, when I heard this week that that crazy fella over there in North Korea. By the way, he has got the ugliest haircut I have ever seen. I mean, could you fix him up? Could you? I mean, I don't know if you can even do anything with that. I'm looking over here at Kathy Burton. I mean, it's in rough shape. Anyway, and he could use some different style clothes too, but anyway, that's a whole other subject. Um, but when I saw that, I immediately was reminded of the sovereignty of God. I mean, the possibility of a, of a nuclear war, is, I mean, is just, wow. But you must know that God is in control. Amen. And the only way that you're going to know that he is in control is if you are in his book. If some tragedy happened today, would you hold fast to the precious Bible promises that we find in Isaiah 26 and verse 19. It says, Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for you do is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Or what about Psalm 91? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and in Him I will trust. Or the famous 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What about Psalm 120 and verse number 1? In my distress, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. Amen. Romans 8 and verse number 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Or Revelation 21 and verse number 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When you're in the heat of it, 
When you're in the middle of a mind-boggling situation, you, have, you better know the promises of God. And the only way to know them is to read them in God's Word. Right. How am I going to increase my faith? Well, we kind of already addressed this, but use the faith. Dr. Lee Robertson said this, Every achievement of faith leads to a greater faith. Sometimes when we're in the midst of some type of battle or mind-boggling situation, we have to praise God on credit. God, I know you came through back there. I know you came through back then. And so I'm going to praise you on credit right now and say, I'm going to trust you and praise you that you're going to work this thing out. Sometimes you've got to praise him on credit. Use the faith that has already been put into you, the faith that you have already experienced, and know that he's going to work it out. Use the faith. The next thing, how is faith increased? By, how is faith increased? By faith. This might sound or seem like a strange statement, but the reality is we are often tempted to put our trust in material things. Instead of having faith in faith. Our finite minds can only understand a certain part of our life. But when faith comes into help, we understand what is lacking. So how can we grow our faith? How can our faith be increased? Well, the answer is the Bible. We've already established it comes from the Bible. Read what God has done for others. Read his great promises. God challenges us to prove him, to try him, and challenge him. And I want to challenge you today to launch out into the deep waters of faith and trust him based upon the promises that are in this book. But you're not going to know them if you're not in it. We need to use the faith that we have, pray for our faith to be increased, and get into the Word of God. Number three, use the faith of others. How are we going to keep the faith in this mind-boggling culture? Use the faith of others. Now, when you think about the word plagiarism, um, for you all that are students, if you plagiarize in school... Courtland, that don't work, does it? No. Um, do you have y'all heard about? Uh, it was a few. Um, it was the end of school, of college last year. Um, two UCLA students broke into the administrative offices there and stole the answers to their final exam. I don't know if you heard about this. Now, you can't do that, <laughs> all right? That's, that's plagiarism, that's copying, that's just outright stealing, I guess. But, but in this case, when we talk about plagiarizing someone else's faith, that's okay. Mm-hmm. That is okay. Because I can tell you some things. There, are, there have been times in my life when I haven't had enough faith, but I can look at the faith of someone else and say, if they can do it, I can do it. Sometimes we have to be reminded of the faith of Moses at the Red Sea. Or the faith of Joshua conquering Jericho. Or the faith of Gideon conquering the Midianites. Or the faith of Elijah over the prophets of Baal. Or the faith of David in an awful heathen land. Copy for yourself the kind of faith that these great men here in Scripture had. The Bible tells us about these and others so we can copy and use the faith that they had. If you pay attention, look around you. There are people all around you in your life that have great faith. When I went um, last week to see Shirley Mullahan, I walked into the room and 
uh, don't tell her, don't tell her I said this. But she was kind of out of it. Um, and I didn't know if it was the drugs that she was on or, or the issue that was going on with her. But, uh, but that's to be expected. When you go to see somebody in the hospital, they're typically doped up on something, you know. And, um, and so we were talking for a few minutes, and she really wasn't sure kind of who I was or what was going on. Uh, but once she figured all that out, we were talking about the issue that she was dealing with. And at that point in time, it, the, the, the prognosis was not good. And she said to me, God healed me before, and I expect nothing less. Amen. <laughs> wow. Can I tell you, this, that, that increased this young preacher's faith. Amen. Amen. To hear her say that. Amen. God's done this before and I expect nothing less. Wow. Use the faith of the people around you to encourage you to keep the faith. If God was with them, then he's going to be with me. Amen. If God was faithful to them, he's going to be faithful to me. Have faith in God and trust Him. Lastly, number four. How are we going to keep the faith in a mind-boggling culture? Let faith add to your life. You know, so many people and even Christians complain about emptiness that is in their life. But I can assure you today that faith in God adds to your life. It adds peace to your life. Philippians 4 and verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. Many of you have heard of the singing group, the Wisnets, and they sing a song. Worry ends where faith begins, and they have a t-shirt that says, if you're going to pray, don't worry, and if you're going to worry, don't pray. That's pretty good. You see, when we have faith, faith adds peace to our lives. This is the very thing that everyone wants in their life, even Christian or not. Everyone wants to have peace. And the one way to have peace is to have faith. If there is one thing that we need in the mind-boggling culture that we live in, it is peace. Um, I've told you all this before. I'm a news junkie. I just love the news. I don't know why. But the news and Andy Griffith. It's about all I watch. But many people call me an old soul. I don't know. But, but I love watching the news. But I mean, I have to admit, sometimes it's just like too much. I just have to shut it off. <laughs> because it is depressing to see what's going on around us. But oh, what peace I have <laughs> because I have put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It adds peace to your life. The second thing is that faith adds courage to your life. Is God, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, you all know that um, I was in the mortuary business before I came down here, and I had the opportunity of serving many military families um, as they buried their loved ones that were killed in action. And uh, I remember uh, we were taking care of, we were going to an airport to pick up um, a 24-year-old fellow that was killed in Afghanistan and the lieutenant colonel showed up and um, he was a part of the funeral that day and in his eulogy that he um, spoke about 
He said that the, the men that were under his command in Afghanistan, um, in all of them, he, this lieutenant colonel was in charge of about 6,000 soldiers. And in every one of the barracks, as you would come out the door, just above the door, it said, be strong and courageous. The battle is the Lord's. Over every barracks. And he said, I can't tell you how pumped up that got those soldiers. He talked about one particular battle when, when the um, soldiers were trying to take over a village that was heavily guarded and, and built up by the Taliban. And these 6,000 soldiers um, that were under his command, I, th I think he said 250 of them were going to go and take this village back. And it did not look good. They knew the firepower that, was, um, that they were coming up against, and they knew what artillery the, the Taliban had, and they weren't sure what was going to happen. In fact, the, he told his, uh, his lieutenants and his sergeants to prepare the men Prepare the soldiers because this could be bloody. And so he said they, they're all gathered, these 250 men they're gonna, that are going to go in and take the village, they're all gathered in one barracks there on the base. And he gives them this big pumped up speech. And he said, I can say all of that, but I want to tell you this. Be strong and courageous. The battle is the Lord's. They went off to fight that battle and not one man Amen. came back injured. Amen. Afterward, I, I had to assume that that lieutenant colonel had to be a Christian. Amen. So I went up and talked to him long after the funeral was over and I said, can you finish that story? What happened? He said, well, all the men came back and no one was injured and four of them got saved. <laughs> you see, when you have a faith, it gives you courage. And when that faith is displayed in front of others, they notice. So, now that we know we have to have a faith, Keeping the faith in a mind-boggling culture. So what kind of faith shall we, should we have? Very quickly. Number one, let your faith be a Bible faith. Base all of your faith on the Word of God. Number two, let your faith be a rejoicing faith. Faith in Christ will give you a song. We have Christ as our Savior and heaven as our home. Our faith is expressed in the many songs that we sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great Thou art. Amen. We have a rejoicing. Let your faith be a rejoicing faith. Thirdly, let your faith be an emphatic faith. Don't be ashamed of your faith. Speak it out. Speak it loud. Be emphatic about it. About it. Be passionate about it. And number four, the most important faith we must have is a redeeming faith. It's one thing to, to trust Christ and to trust God in our daily lives, but if we have never trusted Him as our personal Lord and Savior, then we have missed it all. Right, right. The most important faith decision you will ever make is putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Not whether or not the car you buy is safe, because we put our faith in cars, we put our faith in chairs, I have the faith that if I sit down, sit my big hind end in that chair, it's going to hold me up, right? That's faith. Right? That is faith. Amen. But the most important faith decision you will ever make is whether you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior.
If you are here today and you do not know Him as your personal Lord and Savior, do not leave today unless you know for sure that you have a redeeming faith.